There we go. All right. I know. I feel like we've already done an awful lot of work this morning. Okay. And I also, now there are my glasses. Okay. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I already told you that. Um, and here's an overview. So as I mentioned, I'm going to give some history um, under the title, Is There Anything New Under the Sun? Um, and then I'm going to talk about the Data Club's project in four chunks. Um, one is to tell you the design criteria that we came up with for the materials we're developing. Let me take this down so it's not in your way. Um, and that, in particular, might be the thing that is most useful for you if you're thinking about how to apply what we've done to work that you're doing. Um, then I'm going to tell you how it played out and really tell you about one specific um, chunk of material that we designed and, um, and how it worked out when we tried it with some kids last summer. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about some assessment instrument development. And then I'm going to have a wild hair idea at the end that I want to engage you with. Uh, so this is a little bit of history. And I like to think about this as how my career became sexy after 30 years. <laughs> So I have been doing research on statistical reasoning since the late 80s. And I used to tell people, I said, what do you do? Oh, I study statistical reasoning. I do research on statistics education. And I'd get people like in planes, they'd move away from me, or they'd yawn or something. And so these are all the, the so I used to say data analysis, or statistics, or statistical reasoning, or data literacy. Now, though, I can say data science, and people say, Oh, that's so interesting. I know someone who just became a data scientist, and they're making a lot of money. So suddenly, I am a data science educator, and I am, you know, and some of you know, I'm, you know, getting toward the end of my career, and suddenly it's like I'm the hot new thing. So this is a good thing. But I do not forget my roots, and I feel like one of my platforms or one of my soapboxes when I go out and talk to people is to say, let's not throw away the 30 years or 40 years of research that's already been done on the way people understand data, because most of it is still relevant right now. And so I like to go back to um, something from the 1980s, when some of you weren't even born yet. Uh, <laughs> now, let's see, maybe that's not true. <laughs> but often it is when I'm talking to people. Uh, so this is um, a, an absolutely wonderful set of elementary school curriculum on data in the days when the math community really thought that data was part of mathematical reasoning, which I still think it is. But for a variety of political reasons, it got kicked out of the Common Core for math. This was published in 1989. It was developed at Turk before I got there. This is actually how I got to Turk. Um, I was on the advisory board for this project. And this was also the precursor to the investigations curriculum, which some of you know about, which has been one of Turk's big contributions to math education. And I love this quote from the first page of this book, which I could read without my glasses if I look up there. And I, this, this quote to me just really, I mean, it's a wonderful educational philosophy quote. So we introduce students to good literature in their early years. And I know some of you in here are language arts people, so I hope this speaks to you. We do not reserve great literature until they're older. On the contrary, we encourage them to read it or we read it to them. Similarly, we can give young students experience with real mathematical processes rather than saving the good mathematics for later. Through collecting and analyzing real data, students encounter the uncertainty and intrigue of real mathematics. I just think, I mean, it's a wonderful statement. It is a wonderful educational philosophy. And it's also too bad that this has gotten left out of the curriculum to a large extent. I'm also happy to share these with you. You're welcome to take pictures. But if you want me to share the slides, I'll do that. So don't worry. Um, so then, so after like 15 years of working on data, I realized, well, you know, a lot of our math is kind of geared toward getting kids to calculus in, as a 12th grade math topic. And that's like the thing that gets you into college. And so this is 
2005, I wrote an article called Math That Matters, and it was basically an argument for replacing calculus as the capstone math course with statistical reasoning, data analysis, whatever you want to call it. Um, it got published, didn't make any difference, um, obviously, uh, or we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, but interestingly, data science has kind of come back in through computational thinking. And I, I, I have some trouble with this, but I'll take it. You know, However, we can get data science and data analysis back in the curriculum. But for me, the fact that we have to argue that it's really because it's about computers seems like it misses the point. Um, but as I said, I'm old enough to compromise. So here is. <coughs> So that's the, the very brief history, but just so that you have in mind kind of how we got to where we are. Um, so the Data Clubs project is a STEM plus C grant, and for those of you who know NSF, um, that means that we had to argue that the topic we were working with was something plus computation. So we argued that data analysis is mathematics plus computation. So, you know, you can make that argument. I don't think that's all of data analysis, but we convinced them. Um, and I just want to make sure I mention all of our partners. Um, so Science Education Solutions, which is um, actually a kind of um, disseminated group that um, has its headquarters in Los Alamos, um, PERG, which does our, which used to be at Leslie, is now at Endicott, which does our evaluation, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, which is doing, hosting some um, uh, educational groups for us, Oxford, Oxford Hill School District, which is a, a very rural district in Maine, and then the Malden Y, where we've been working, and Girls Incorporated in Lynn. So we have a lot of partners for this, and um, I always have to acknowledge NSF, so you see I've says, thank you, NSF. I have acknowledged NSF. Um, and we decided to create materials not for in-school, but for out-of-school. And the reason for that was there's no room in the curriculum at this point for anything um, that isn't in the Common Core. So there's no room for computational thinking either, and so people are trying to figure out how to incorporate it into other things. There's really no room for data analysis, and I just didn't want to have our curriculum development be compromised by the constraints of school. So we kind of wanted to say, what can we do when we don't have constraints? When we're just working out of school, we can decide what the topic is. It doesn't have to fit into a science curriculum. And, we can, and let's just see what happens. So that's why we're working out of school. And we've been working in um, after schools and in summer camps. Um, the modules are about 10 to 12 hours. Usually, they're either like 10 hours of 10 one-hour sessions. Last summer, we did five two-hour sessions. So, and those are different, so that's kind of interesting. Um, remember, we're working with middle school kids. So for those of you who either had middle school kids or have taught middle school kids, you know that um, they can be very passionate. They can also be distractible. There's all kinds of stuff going on with middle school kids. Um, we targeted participants entering 7th and 8th grade. We actually had some kids who were entering 6th grade as well. Um, and we're developing three modules focusing on three different topics. And each one includes a large publicly available data set, which for us is a big piece of the new um, reason for having data science is that there's, at least that's the argument people make, all these data are so available you can just get to them. Um, yes, but. Uh, so, and our con we have people said, so what do you want kids to know at the end of this? And the answer is not mean, median, mode, and standard deviation. So, but what is it? So this is what we hope that kids understand. Um, data are everywhere, but turning life into data is a really complicated process that involves measurement and a whole lot of decisions about who you ask and how you ask and how, what kind of scales you use. And that complexity is something we really want students to understand. And I, I think I'm, I'm not quoting a lot of literature, but, but um, Rich Lair and Leona Schabel have some really good um, articles on this process of data modeling and that understanding this first part about measurement and how you go from life, which is very complicated, to something that you can call data, what the complexities of that are. 
data organized into cases, and each case has a bunch of attributes. So that very basic aspect of data organization is something we want students to know. And the two words we teach them are case and attributes. So in terms of vocabulary, that's really where we want them to focus. And then what's really important is to know that any data set can be used to answer some questions and not others. So all of what you know, we talk about, fake news, blah, 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 data can answer some questions, but some of your data is just not going to answer your questions. So knowing what that match is is a really important foundational skill around data. So we have some design criteria. So what are our criteria for topics, for the data sets, for the tools that we use, and for the activities that we engage kids in? So for our topics, um, there is a lovely article. I tried to find the original, original source of it, and I was somewhat successful about curricula being windows and mirrors. Has anybody heard that um, metaphor before, or is that? You can kind of figure out what it means. But, but we want to try to have topics that kids see themselves in. So, you know, they're not going to look at stock prices, because so a few kids might see themselves, but not many. But also ones that open up their, their world. So the topics we have chosen are things that we think kids will identify with, but also give them information they wouldn't have otherwise. And we're also trying, because kids at this age are actually very interested in fairness and social justice, we're trying to have things that they could imagine taking action about. I think that's the part we're still working on. We haven't quite gotten there, but that's been one of our criteria. Um, my first point is that working out of school um, means that we have the freedom to choose any topic we want, um, but also we have to keep the kids engaged. So that has that's a different set of constraints than when you're developing in-school curriculum. And it also means that the statistical concepts are going to emerge from the data. So we're not going in saying the most important thing we, that they need to know is five measures of center, or even three. We're ha it comes out of the structure of the data. And I'll show you how that differs from one module to another. So the topics, and we also have had a youth advisory group that has helped us think about topics and told us which ones they think that they and their friends would find interesting. So the three, well, we have two for sure and one question mark. So the one I'm going to talk about most is teens and technology, which we also call the social media module. And as you can imagine, seventh and eighth graders no question they're interested in that, and no question they know a lot about it, a lot more than me. Um, we have a module that we just um, tried up in Maine on Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases and climate correlates of that. Um, and then our third one is either going to be about the animals and animal shelters and what happens to them, how many get adopted, um, or about sports injuries and which sports are more likely to lead to concussions and how do they do concussion diagnosis. So those, the, the, the third one we're not sure about yet, but we've tried both of those topics and they are of interest to, um, to middle school kids. So, um, so our criteria for data sets. So this picture, um, I was asked to give, I'm almost wearing the same clothes. <laughs> Um, I was asked to give a talk at a, um, a big data literacy meeting a couple years ago. And I started to think about the term big data. And I thought, all right, so what's little data? And then I thought, well, maybe what we want is just right data that's in the middle. So I, I was giving this talk at the New York Hall of Science. And I said, Maybe I could do Goldilocks and the three bears, and could you come up with three chairs for me? And I could do, you know, the little chair and the medium chair and the big chair. <laughs> so they said, well, of course, we have a little chair and a medium chair. And because they're a museum, they said, and we'll make you a big chair. <laughs> so they made that for me <laughs> for the talk. And I didn't give much, the whole talk lying in it, but I did um, give a little bit of the talk lying in it. Um, and they now have it on the floor, and apparently everybody takes pictures in it. So it was actually, it was a great thing. I felt, I didn't want them to just make it for me, so I'm glad that it was useful. Um, but the point is that big data are really complicated, and there's lots of cases, and there's lots of mess. And that's not what we want kids to start with, because they'll be overwhelmed. 
but we usually go way too far in the other direction. And we give them these data sets, or we ask them to collect data around things like, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? And then they have a little bar graph that has chocolate and vanilla on it. It's like, if that were all data were, nobody would be interested. What does it tell you? What do you learn? So the trick is to find something in the middle that is accessible to middle school kids, but also has richness, enough richness of relationships in it that they can see what it means to be interested in data. They can see what they can learn and they can understand the power of data because being able to analyze data does give you power. Um, so that, that's our criteria for data sets. Now in terms of tools, um, we did, we kind of had a tool in mind, which is CODAP. Has that, who here has heard of CODAP? All right, so third to half. Um, it stands for Common Online Data Analysis Platform. It's been developed by Concord Consortium, but kind of thinking be, back, like why CODAP, other than the fact that we really like the people at Concord. Um, so it needs to be accessible for middle school students, deal with largest data sets relatively easily. It has to make the difference between cases and attributes clear. And um, Excel, for example, does not do that. So you can rearrange your data any way you want in Excel. It's totally, it doesn't care what's the row and what's the column. But in a piece of software that really is trying to teach about data, the rows and the columns mean different things. The rows are, are cases, the columns are attributes. So that was a really important criterion for us. Um, we wanted to have multiple representations of the same data, which you can do in, in CODAP, and we wanted them to be linked. So, you know, having multiple linked representations is, is something that's been talked about in math education for a while, and it really is important in data analysis because you want to be able to highlight a, a case in a table and see where it is on the graph. And so I'll show you in a minute how that works. And if you have multiple graphs, you want to be able to see where is this person in this graph, this graph, and this graph. So it gives you a sense of the immutability of the cases and of their identity. And so it gives you um, a way into the data that I think is often missing. And then there's also a concept that a colleague of mine named Tim Erickson has developed called data moves. And these are, what are the ways that you interact with data? So making a graph is one of them, but things like looking at subsets of the data, like let's look at just the people who are older than 25 and see what kind of relationships there are. So this whole idea of filtering and looking at subsets um, has to be easy in a piece of software that we wanted to use. Um, so when do I get to code app? Hang on a second. I guess not for a few minutes. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll show you more about CODAP in a second. And then um, our criteria for the activities. Um, so again, Tim Erickson has this idea of what is, it, what is data science? And he says, so when an activity is data science, what does it smell like? Like he has a sniff test for data science. And the two big things about that, so for example, like plotting a bunch of line, a bunch of points and drawing a line through them is not necessarily data science. But one of his criteria is that you should be awash in data. That when you see the data, you should not necessarily know what you're gonna find. It should feel a little overwhelming, but you should be able to get into it. But so finding that, that happy medium. And that then you should be using data moves, these ways of subsetting the data, looking at parts of it, graphing three variables at a time should all be part of how you do get into the data. And so we want, but we also wanted participants to have some experience collecting data because that's, that gives you a whole lot more, uh, more in-depth understanding of what, it, what somebody meant when they answered a question. So we want them to also um, collect data. And then we also want them to have experience representing data both on the computer and by hand. So I should tell you more about that. And I'm realizing I got a late start and I, I was told I had to stop at 11.30, so um, I'm gonna talk faster. Um, so I'm gonna tell you some about the module that was the one we did last summer, 
with a group of about two dozen kids, which was way too many at the Mald um, at Malden High School. Um, and this was the teens and technology topic. And the hook we used was this article that came out about a year ago in the Boston Globe. And it was talking about the Pew uh, Research Center's findings that 45% um, of teens say they are online almost constantly and that this has doubled in the past, in two years, since two years before that. Um, so notice, by the way, that this, this is based on 2014. Oh, no, I'm sorry, the 2014-15 Pew survey, 24% of teens said that they were online almost constantly. And then in the 2018, it had doubled. Um, so that was enough to get kids' attention. I mean, they all had opinions and, you know, I do that too or I don't do that, I don't like it, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the data set we used was, in fact, a Pew Research Center um, technology and internet use survey from 2014. Keep that number in your mind. It was a 37-page interview um, administered online to, um, it's actually parents, and then the parents turned it over to a teenage child. Uh, the data set that is available is about 1,200 cases, about over 300 variables. Um, and obviously, that was way too much to give to kids. So we chose about 10 variables. We got about 50 cases as the introductory data set to get them started. And then we actually created three thematic data sets, which I'm not sure I would do again. One was on internet use, one was on friends in the digital age, and one was on video games. And they had 200 cases each, and that is what they did their projects on. Um, I just want to give you some sense of what these questions are. So overall, how often do you use the internet? Almost constantly, several times a day, about once a day, several times a week, once a week, less often. Um, on an average day, about how many text messages do you send and receive on your cell phone? And I can tell you that a lot of responses were in the hundreds. Um, which of the following social media do you use most often? Some of those, they told me, Vine doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is the question that actually turned out to be the nub of the entire module. Because we looked at the results, remember that number 2014? Facebook was very popular in 2014 with students, with uh, middle school students. In 2018, it is not, so some of you know that. Do you know like the movie Eighth Grade, they were actually going to make that with Facebook until the star told the director, no one will believe it, and so then they made it with Instagram, which is what they do use. So immediately on the first day, the kid said, I don't believe these data. Why not? Because Facebook is not, you know, no way. So then I said, oh, yeah, it was collected in 2014. Well, that's why. So interestingly, I, I kind of happened upon a really interesting technique, which is start with data that people don't believe. Because then the question is, so why not? So then you start to dig into what were the questions, how were they asked, when were they collected, who were they asked of. And then, of course, they wanted to collect their own data to show that, oh, but look, if we collect data now from our friends, we'll see something different. So there was an automatic comparison set up, and you'll see some results of that comparison. Oh, and then I just, I also wanted you to see this. Um, so there were a lot of really interesting <coughs> questions about video games. And in particular, when you play games online with others, do you ever feel more connected to friends you play games with who you already know, feel more relaxed and happy, feel more angry and frustrated, or feel connected to people you play games with but aren't friends with yet. And there was a subset of boys who are heavy video game players who found these questions absolutely fascinating. And they spent a lot of time analyzing them. I also want you to notice the possible answers were yes a lot, yes a little, and no. They weren't just yes and no. And when these kids went and collected their own data, they did not necessarily remember what the choices had been, so their data wasn't as comparable as they wanted it to be. But that was a really good lesson. All right, now I get to code out. Um, so I told you what it is. Um, and the fact that cases have physical presence, each of these dots here is a case. 
It's kind of, you know, and in this case, a case is a person. So it's really easy to read these graphs and you can say, here is a person who uses the internet several times a week and does not have a smartphone. So it's really having the, I just don't know why every data analysis software doesn't have cases represented as icons. It just feels to me like, of course. Um, and I was going to do a quick, oop, oh dear. I was going to do this, yeah, okay. So I was just going to quickly show you CODAP. Um, so here's a you know, data set in CODAP, looks like a data set in just about anything. Um, and if I make a graph, so I, all I do to make a graph is click on graph. Oh, shoot. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay, let's see if, I, if that'll do it. So let's try this. <coughs> um, and then, no, I don't want to do that. There we go. Wasn't as seamless as I had hoped, but there we go. <coughs> that'll do for now. Um, so let's say we want to see how many, well, let's just see if, let's just look at age. So this is how to make a graph. You grab the name of the variable and drag it to an axis. That's it. Um, and now we know those are all individuals. And if I click on one of these, watch what happens to the um, display, the, the graph, the table on the left. So. I made this into a, a different format because otherwise it would take over the whole screen. So if I click on any of these, it's going to go to that case. So it's reinforcing this connection between the case and the case's representation in a graph. Um, if I want to look at the gender of these people, I just drag this to the y-axis, and now it has separated them into males and females. And I can notice, I don't know what I, there's nothing particular to notice right here, but um, I could also, let's actually change the y-axis and put number of texts per day. Okay, so I have kind of a scatter plot, but because I only have five things on the x-axis, they're, they're more um, vertical. And then I could take gender and drop it into the middle and now it is coloring each of these points by gender. So with that many clicks, I can get a graph of three variables. And so anybody can get a graph of three variables. And if you can interpret a graph like this, you're, getting, you're doing pretty well. So it, this software makes the process of creating graphs really, really simple, so, as it should be, because the challenge should be how do you interpret them, not how do you make them. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things here that I'll just, so this will allow me, for example, to hide different cases. So that idea of being able to take subsets is very simple to do. Um, this will allow me to choose um, least squares lines and, and plot functions. If I had a single, it would have given me mean median. Um, if I had a univariate distribution, whoops. Um, and then this allows me to um, let's make these points a little bigger and change the females to uh, some other colors. So, um, so I can actually make um, display changes right on the graph really easily as well. So now I have to go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. All right, oh, you know what, I'm, this is going to be, I'm going to have to go back and forth a few times. So what I wanted to show you were a few things that, a few final projects that participants um, did this summer. And the one other thing I need to tell you before I show you that is that they collected data among themselves, and we added that data to the data set that they were working with. So remember, but remember, the data set they were working with had 200 cases. 
and they were really bad at collecting data. So we added like 10 to 12 cases. They didn't even collect them from everybody in their group. They, you know, like, they were clicks, not surprisingly. Girls collected from the girls, boys collected from the boys. Um, but we then added a, you had a question? We, that's a learning opportunity for an incomplete data set. Yes, it is. And yeah. I... In sense, drawing to a false scenario. Yes. And we did talk about it a little bit. It's one of those things where it happened toward the end, and then I was like, oh, come back tomorrow so we can talk about that. But we did mention it. I would say some of the kids really got... In fact, you'll see one of the projects, the girl says, I can't really compare them because one's so much bigger than the other. I'm not sure every student got that. But yes, that was a, it was a, a total teachable moment. Um, we added another variable, which um, was Pew for all the data they'd been given, and Malden for the data that they collected, because that's where they collected the data. So you'll see that, um, and now I'm going to have to do what I just did again. Um, Probably an easier way to do this. But. Okay. So here is one of, let's move these things around a little bit. So here is one of the final projects. This was actually a girl going into sixth grade. She was pretty precocious, I have to say. Um, and her, she looked at the relationship between how people talk to their closest friend and gender and then compared between Pew and Malden. And you can see right here in this text box, she says, we certainly have to acknowledge the fact that the Pew interviews, interviewees outnumber the Malden ones 191 to 12. So we can't really assume a lot about Malden. So as I said, that was beautiful. Um, as I said, precocious also. Um, and she says there were no female interviewees that used video games as their primary communication method. While it is simply a stereotype that video games are more for boys than girls, I think people tend to follow those stereotypes subconsciously, nervous about stepping out from the crowd or standing out. She's a really good writer. However, this is simply a theory not meant to offend anybody. <laughs> she's really a poster child, I'll tell you. She's great. Um, so, but you can see here that um, um, that I thought maybe that was my time that I had to stop. No. Um, this is a very typical thing that she has chosen to remark on places where there are no um, where there's none, so when she says there were no female interviewees that use video games. And this is actually something that I've seen over the years in looking at both how students and teachers interpret graphs, because it's, it's a comfortable thing to say nothing happened there. It's a deterministic thing. Um, having to say it's more likely for this than that is a more difficult thing for people to process, and we don't know how to talk probabilistically. So I often see people saying, well, nobody is in that category. And, and it's also a way to get away from the difference in sample size. You say, well, there's just nobody. So you know, it doesn't matter how many people we ask. So again, I didn't have a chance to process that with her. But it's just something that I have seen over the years in, look, in doing research on the ways people try to deal with data when it's probabilistic. Um, so that, do people have any questions about this or about the process she went through for creating this or comments about what she did since I've been talking at you for a while. I, I, I like the idea that they're able to uh, implement their thoughts on this tool and you're able to capture that and see where they might be in this process so you can understand it. I love the fact that it's easy to, for them to put text boxes yeah, in, exactly. so they don't have to go to another program to add commentary. Mm -hmm. So the assumption is you have to explain yourself, and here's how to do it. I think it would be really funny to, to, to ask them how they communicate with their parents. 
<laughs> there actually was a question like that on the survey, but it wasn't one of the ones we chose. <laughs> actually, it was a question for parents. It was, if you're trying to get your kid, how do you do it? And many of them said text, and one of them said, I yell up the stairs. <laughs> do you actually capture like a timestamp when they implement this and what was being displayed? You know, the interactivity of where they're at in this process and when they express the thought? We didn't in this case. I mean, we could, whoops. I just, um, there's, there's not, I mean, there's, there's a basic logging system in Kodak, but it's not at the level that allows you to replay things. But I have, in doing interviews with kids, just used QuickTime, and so I have the entire, including what they're saying, all in a, in a video. So when we're actually doing research, we do that. Um, it would be an awful lot to look through um, with 23 kids for 10 hours. So, um, so Kodak has, if you can look through back in Kodak and say, how many times did people um, plot a line? So they have that kind of logging. I haven't actually used it as a data source, but, um, but it, it could very well. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's why we do some interviews because we get. Yeah, well, there's a lot to find out for sure. Um, I, I want to show you another. So here's what I'm going to do in the next zero minutes. Can I have five more minutes? Okay. Um, I will show you one more example of um, of a final project, and then I want to tell you my wild hair idea because I promise. So. Um, Thing is, I think I have to go back to PowerPoint <coughs> to get to that one. This one is simpler. Um, so this was one of the boys um, who found, who was in the I'm going to explore video games group. And um, he looked at, so here's this place where the Pew data asked for yes a little and yes a lot. And when he asked his friends, he just asked them yes or no. So he couldn't really compare the data. Um, but he did find that in both Pew and Malden, playing video games made people happy, um, either a little or a lot. Um, it would have been interesting to put gender on this. I'm going to do that now, actually, just out of curiosity. So we can also see that. <laughs> so now you can see who he asked in Malden, yeah. all the boys. <laughs> and this was something everyone noticed. You never asked us. Um, and also that a lot of the gamers, the people who, um, these are primarily male also. Um, so, and his question was, I was wondering what the age groups of the Pew was, because in Malden I knew we didn't use the right age group. And so part of the issue was that they were actually a little younger than the Pew group. The Pew group was 13 to 17, and there were some 12-year-olds in this group. So they were very aware that that was another reason why the data might not be comparable. So I would say th this group got that idea that they should collect some data to show their reality, but that they couldn't do a good job of comparing it to the Pew data. Yeah? What are the, uh, the cases for? It looks like the purple ones have slightly variable color. Does it mean something that oh, some of them are lighter and some of them That's are a really good, I don't think so. Um, they should be all the same color. I don't know if that's like my monitor or something, but that's a good point. I see what you're seeing. Um, no, but, but I have no idea. I think in this data set, male and female, or is a dichotomous variable? Okay. Might not be the right way to do it, but that's what's in this data set. Um, so I want to do my wild hair ideas, that, and I'm happy to show you more Kodak stuff or whatever. Um, so, maybe let me go back to the thing. 
This is what I'm going to talk about. So have, have any of you seen this book, Dear David? All right, this is, this is a wonderful book. And I think that it should be the start of a data revolution. So let me explain what it is and I, I, why I think that. So this is a, a book about two graphic artists um, who are also data nerds. And they decided to get to know one another by sending each other graphical representations of pieces of their life based on data. So for example, they would pick a topic every week. And a topic might be um, my closet. Uh, and then they would each go off and decide what attributes of their closet they wanted to collect data on, and then create a representation, and then create a legend for it. And they would literally send each other postcards <laughs> once a week for a year. And this book is a collection of their postcards. And it's beautiful. Right? When you look at books of data, they don't usually look like this. It's gorgeous. Um, and now they are graphic artists. But the idea of getting to know someone by having these kinds of images of slices of their life, I think is fascinating. We did an activity like this with kids this summer. We had them go around the building and look for screens. And for each screen, keep track of whether it was on or off, what size it was, and whether someone was looking at it or not. And I have some lovely examples of the way they decided to show those characteristics in images. Um, but for me, I think it, it's a hard thing to do. You really have to kind of practice um, noticing things in your life. I sometimes called it radical data noticing. Um, and these women have a new book, which is, they, I'm not getting a commission, but I've been <laughs> run around the country talking about this, which is called Observe, Collect, Draw, and the um, subtitle is Discover the Patterns in Your Everyday Life. And so it has a bunch of exercises for noticing patterns in your everyday life. Like at the beginning, it starts with count your breath. I mean, it's really a kind of, like, it's a practice to... Um, notice those things, and then they talk about what are the characteristics of an image that could you could map attributes to. So the data part of this is you have to figure out, so let's say um, I'm talking about size of something. So my physical, my picture of it could actually be things of different sizes, or it could be arrayed along a line that means size, or it could be different colors. So, so can you tell us the name of that book again also? Yeah, so one's called Dear Data, so that one's up here. Observe, Collect, Draw. Thank you. Um, so what, what is data representation? It really is deciding how an individual attribute is represented graphically, right? So in Kodak, we don't have that many choices. We have placement along the x and y axis and color. That's what we got. Um, but there are lots of other options, right? There's, there's shape, there's um, position of all other kinds, there's size. And so this book is really teaches you how to figure out that mapping. And that's a really, it's a very deep data skill. So knowing how to create that mapping and knowing how to interpret mappings like that, that's really what data representation is all about. So, I've been thinking, what kinds of pen pal programs can we set up using this kind of structure? Like, what would be, you can't just, you know, like, take two groups of kids and say become pen pals, but what are social structures that already have some of that in it, or where this kind of communication about one's personal life could serve a purpose? So I, that's kind of where I'm, I'm just kind of being wild hair about that and trying to come up with some ideas about how to best use this kind of technology. Yeah? They could do it on social media. They could. They could take pictures. And it, for me, it's just like, how do you connect people so that they feel they have an audience? <coughs> but yeah, social media would be, it would be great to do it on that. Maybe you'd have too big an audience. I don't know. I mean, I just, I'm kind of just trying to think about it. Yeah. Like a playground, installate like a sculpture kind of thing. That you hmm. 
So maybe interact, interact with. Oh, that's interesting. So thinking about having like a framework somewhere that people could then create something public with. Yeah. So when you were doing the um, code app like data stuff with the kids, you didn't deal with like the this mapping between data and representations because they only had the one thing? I you know, I actually did. Um, after we did the Dear Data, um, we had a discussion that was so when you did Dear Data, you used this and this to show whether a screen was on or off. What did we do with code app? So we did say in Kodak, we, we had the option of where it is on the x-axis, where it is on the y-axis, and what color it is. So we did talk about that. Yeah. And I think some kids got that, and other kids it was a little, you know, the, the media were so different that it was hard to make that connection. But I think for some that it really it helped see the unity of that. Does it have to be a relationship between two people that's ongoing, or can it be different people? I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, that's what this was. Right, right. Um, I had the idea that maybe, like, when freshmen are going to high school, that they get that they get a senior and they exchange a couple postcards with the senior about like what's a day like in high school. I mean, that was one idea I had. I think it works. I think this story worked. Um, not totally, but to a large extent because they were creating a friendship and creating a relationship. So I think there's something about the, the interpersonal relationship that made a difference. But that doesn't mean that they, you know, it couldn't be done otherwise. Here, by the way, this is a, a week of phone addiction. And you can see there's the seven days. And the key, or the legend down below, is really complicated. <laughs> and creating that I think, is really an intellectual challenge. Um, and then, so one was driving, I can't even read it, during work. So those are all different times or purposes. So you can see, she says how to read it. And then she has Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Phone pickup moments lived in, in chronological order. So that's <coughs> mm -hmm. from morning to night. So she's used a lot of placement on the page to do chronological stuff. So placement horizontally is about um, day of the week, and placement vertically is about time of the day, and then the colors are about purpose. And this is actually really easy for kids to interpret. I think especially because it has all the days of the week. They immediately got that it was Monday through Sunday. Um, but when I ask them, I'll ask you, what's the case here? What's the what? The case. If we think of this as cases and attributes, what is the case? That's picking up the phone. So it's a it's an instance of picking up the phone. Right, right. It's yeah. not a phone. No, no, no. Because that was the first thing the kid said. Okay. And it's not a hand. It's right. it's an instance. And so that's actually a little tricky. I would actually say it's like the busyness of that individual. Well, further interpretation of if they use this tool, this is how busy they are during the week. So that is certainly what you see in this. But if I ask the question, what's a case? What's one of them that has a position in along X, a position along Y, and a color? Like those are the three things that each case, the three attributes for each case. Mm -hmm. So then the case is a time I picked up the phone. And it has a day, a time of day, and a purpose. Is that making, any, is that making sense? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Though, um, personally, I'm confused with the phone. Oh, that's because you can't read all this down here, right. right. Yeah, why they touch the phone. That's why, yeah. yeah. So it says, play music, turn on or off something. That I can't even read, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, check something, check the time. So, so they're all purposes. They're all what they did. Jack? Can you explain why the symbol they chose was chosen? Like why it's that zigging with the dot on one side? And uh, I, no, I don't think so. And I think that's part of the artistic thing. <laughs> As, you know, it actually makes it pretty, I think. You know, it has a kind of 
um, artistic appeal, and if it had been something else, it would have been different. So I think some of it is really just what do I want it to look like? I mean, some of them are these fantastical flowers where they have things going off at different angles, so they're using the angle, and some of them are just gorgeous. So I don't. So I don't think so. Have you done anything about like how to communicate that aesthetic element of like presenting data and the sort of benefits and drawbacks of like? No, but I think. I think this book has a little of that in it because there are pages here that say like draw a confident line. So they're trying to, to help people imagine how an image can express something both emotional and data. Um, but I haven't. I think that would be fascinating. I look at this and see the sharpness of this. It's an interruption in the person's life. Oh, that's, that's like very it's interesting. Like it's a sharp, it's like, hmm. Interrupting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, like, and that may have yeah. been either explicit or just or subliminal exactly. on her part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm part of a research project called Aesthetics and Astronomy that actually does cover that aesthetic element of data. Oh, cool. Yeah, that is cool. Say a little more about that. So, it's been going on for about a decade, and the different investigators try to survey data in response to astronomy images to figure out the difference between expert and non-expert perception of the data and how we can help to move understanding closer to what the scientific data communicates. Mm. And it's really interesting. Like, for example, there was a discovery that people saw red as hot when really in astronomy blue is hot, so they tried yeah. to switch around the color coding in images. And it's just very interesting work. Yeah, because we think of data as being like non-emotional and non-aesthetic, and in fact, but every but we look at the world through multiple lenses, and one of them is an aesthetic lens or an intuitive lens. I thought you'd find that cool. I do. <laughs> Thank you. There's this group that needs to be spread by the car as an artist, and how scientists. Could I could I get on that list? Oh. I thought you were going to say I couldn't come because I'm not at Harvard. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't do anything. You want to be careful. <laughs> Essentially, they tell it, they, they take a story and all they tell it is crap. Oh, like pie charts or whatever, and they say, like, uh, alcohol consumption or types of alcohol oh, or the ice cream thing and how consumption has changed over. And it's only told minimal text and all crap. Huh. Uh, and, and it's a daily story or thread that is, uh, I seem to waste. At least five or ten yeah, could you do something like this that shows how much time you waste on that? <laughs> I, so I, how, how data is, 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 is told in a yes. different way. And it's, and it's pervasive. Right. It's, so I see that it's 1147. It, okay, pizza's not here yet anyway. Because I understand we have to be out of here at 10 after, right? So you have to eat fast. Yeah. Can you say more about your instruments? Oh, yeah, I skipped that. Because I didn't have time. Uh, yes. So, um, so we we said we were going to create two instruments, and we're still. I don't have even like an alpha version to show you. Well, I could of the interview. So one of them is an interview where we want to see how well students can make this match between the data set and the question. And so. Um, Right now, we're kind of asking them to look at a data set and come up with some questions that they could answer and some questions that they couldn't answer from the data set. And I, I think what we need to do is to have, is to also say, here's a question, could you answer it? Because the questions they can't answer, they just say, well, you know, there's, there's nothing about X in the data set, so I couldn't answer that question. So, um, so I think we have to tweak that. But it is an interview, and it uses CODAP, and it's mostly a post-test, although we want to have a version of it that's a pre-test. Um, one sec, I got you. Um, and then the other thing that we're working on, which we had originally thought was going to be a survey instrument, and now we're not so sure, is something about data dispositions. Like, you know, the idea of dispositions is 
speak these days. And um, what does it mean to be have a positive disposition toward data? Um, and to be honest, I feel like I'm on totally shaky ground with that, and somebody else is taking the lead on it. Thank goodness. Um, uh, our evaluator and my my co-PI Jan Mokros are doing the work on that, and obviously we'll share the the instruments as we develop them. But those are the two things that we thought there's nothing out there. I mean, all of the um, instruments for looking at like there's a whole lot <coughs> of instruments that are called the Locus that are about conceptual use of statistics, but they don't get at that very early just. Can you look at data and say what it will tell you? They're about, can you recognize a distribution? Do you know what a normal fund is? You know, some of those things. But we're not, that's not what we're doing with these kids. So we didn't have a good instrument that would allow us to see if we're doing what we want to do. So the pizza has arrived. But you have a question. Do you do you air? Why don't we do it after we yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.